It is my understanding that social justice outrage, the, you know, posting things about people and taking them down is typically a left-wing phenomenon. I could be wrong. Maybe the right did something earlier, but I'm pretty sure right now when we see someone make this long thread accusing someone of impropriety, it's typically someone on the left accusing someone of being offensive or of harassment or something like that. So the New York Times has this op-ed called The Cruelty of Call-Out Culture. And uh, they say how not to do social changes from David Brooks. This is a story, partly, of a woman who called out someone online and got him stripped of, he got kicked out of his band, he had to move, his life was miserable, he lost his job, she was all happy and proud. And then, a few years later, when she was on the tippy top of her game, lo and behold, she engaged in cyberbullying and harassment of young women in high school, and the same thing happened to her. You reap what you sow. Is this not hard to understand for people on the left? There are many people on the right in the past who have attempted to, uh, like, uh, the, uh, let me rephrase. The evangelical right, you know, in the 90s and 2000s, wanted to ban and restrict certain things. And now it's like flipped, and the left has become overly I ideological. They have their non-theistic religion. They want to ban things. And then when they get banned, they're shocked to find out the systems they build come after them. Why would they ban Alex Jones from all these platforms? I'll tell you why. Not because they actually care about Alex Jones, but because when there's actual... Okay, I'll put it this way. Occupy Wall Street would never have happened without the internet. Plain and simple. Who do you think the, the Facebook, the government, and whoever else cares about more? Alex Jones selling supplements? Or a bunch of activists who want to upset Wall Street? I'll give you a second to think about it. Shouldn't be hard. But let's read through the story a little bit. A number of months ago, I listened to a podcast that, had, that has haunted me since, because it captures something essential about our culture warrior moment. It was from NPR's Always Excellent Invisibilia, Invisibilia series, and it was about a woman named Emily. Emily was a member of, a, of the hardcore punk scene in Richmond Virginia, one, uh, Richmond, Virginia. One day, when she was nearly 30, she was in a van with her best friend who was part of a prominent band. They were heading to a gig in Florida when the venue called to cancel their appearance. A woman had accused Emily's best friend of sending her an unwelcome sexually explicit photograph. His bandmates immediately dismissed her allegations, but inwardly Emily seethed. Upon returning to Richmond, she wrote a Facebook post denouncing her best friend as, a, as an abuser. I disown everything he has done. I do not think it's okay. I believe women. To put it simply, her best friend was accused and she decided to side with someone she didn't know, some random person who said, your best friend's a bad person, said, you know what, I'm gonna believe this stranger. That's called disloyalty, okay? You don't need to be loyal to someone who's a bad person, but typically you give the benefit of the doubt to the people who have your back. And she knifed her best friend in the back. The post worked. He ended up leaving the band and disappeared from the punk scene. Emily heard rumors that he'd been fired from his job, kicked out of his apartment, had moved to a new city and was not doing well. Ever Emily never spoke with him again. That is insane. Absolutely insane. I have some friends. Some of these friends are Trump supporters, okay? No, they're not alt-right. No, they're not Nazis. I have friends who are regular Trump supporters who hold regular day jobs, drink coffee like every other person, and their politics are pretty tepid. Yet I get attacked for simply being friends with them. Well, they, are, they weren't always Trump supporters. My response, fuck you. They're my friends, okay? Now, look, there's a line. If someone I know starts becoming overtly identitarian, I absolutely kind of just, I back away. I have some friends on the left who have embraced overt racism, the, the left-wing white supremacy, and it puts me in a weird situation. I don't want to tell them, like, you know, I'm not your friend anymore because of this, but I will avoid them because I think they've gone freak, freakish into this cultish, psychotic behavior. I don't have, uh, and, and, and admittedly, the only friends I have who have embraced overt racism are on the left, because most of my friends are on the left, so... I know very few people who are actually conservative, and the people who I know who are actually conservative used to be on the left, and then they started supporting Trump. That's a whole other story. The point is, there is a line, but for the most part, my, it, I don't care what you believe politically. We don't, you, want, you want to have an argument about a border wall, finances, taxes, the best way to deal with government policy? I'm like, yeah, sure, we're always going to disagree on that. If you want to start talking about overt racism and things like that, it's like, yeah, I'm back away, not today, man. I'm sorry. The point I'm making is, you have a friend, okay? If someone threatens your friend, it's called loyalty. It's, a, it's an important thing. And in fact, it's one of the most important virtues in my opinion. That's why I love the story of Hachiko the dog. Get ready to dry your eyes. Quick, I'm, I, you know what? I'm not going to get too much into Hachiko. We should read through this a little bit. But basically, it's a story about a dog who waited 10 years 
because his master had died and Hachiko waited at a train station for something like 10 years because he would not abandon those he was loyal to. And that I respect. This person, zero loyalty. Zero. Here's where it gets good. Meanwhile, she was fronting her own band, but in October 2016, she too got called out. In high school, roughly a decade before, someone had posted a nude photo of a female student. Emily replied with an emoji making fun of the girl. This was part of a wider pattern of high school cyberbullying. A post denouncing Emily also went viral. She too was the object of nationwide group hate. She was banned from the punk scene. She didn't leave the house for what felt like months. Her friends dropped her. She was scared, traumatized, and alone. She tried to vanish. It's entirely my life, she told Invisibilia tearfully. Like, this is everything to me, and it's all just, like, done and over. <laughs> Congratulations. You reap what you sow. I'll tell you what. I don't care for any tribe. None. Whatsoever. I want to be on my own. I am... I, I, when, I, when I play World of Warcraft, I pick the rogue character, okay? My, my, I'm always rogue. You know why? Because rogues are probably the best at playing by themselves. If you're not familiar with World of Warcraft, online multiplayer game, the rogue character has the ability, ability to stealth, which is effectively invisibility, and you can go about your business ignoring everyone else if you so choose, and explore and do what you want. That's my playstyle. When I play Fallout and other video games, my playstyle is Sneaky Sniper. Leave me the hell alone, I'm on my own, I'll do my thing, and that's it. You know, don't, no, no parties for me. Admittedly, you still need a party some, sometimes. So I have friends. The point I'm saying is, the point I'm trying to make, there are certain tribes that will light you on fire at a moment's notice if it benefits them. And that's the tribe of the left. Why the hell would I ever want to be friends with these regressive people if at any moment's notice they would turn their back on me and be disloyal? It's like uh, Louis C.K. made a joke. Louis C.K. Everyone makes, makes, yells at me when I say his name wrong. He said, people, people tell you, you learn who your friends are when you go through something like this. And he said, that's terrible. I don't want to know who my real friends are. I like having fake friends. It's a joke. It's supposed to be funny. But the reality is, you do learn who, you, who your real friends are. And here's the scary thing. She learned she had no friends. She was never friends with that guy she turned her back on. They claimed to be best friends. Bull fucking shit. I'm getting me swearing now. She was not his friend. Because friends don't do that to each other. Friends defend each other. Friends trust each other. Friends will do what they can to be loyal to each other. These people have no friends. It's all just convenience. They politically fit in, so they'll say whatever it takes, but guess what? Bites the hand that feeds, it comes back for you. And now you reap what you sow. You helped create. You helped create this world. And now you get to wallow in it. And you... It, she accepted the legitimacy of the call-out posts. Process. If she was called out, it must mean she deserved to be rendered into, into a non-person. I don't know what to think of myself other than like, I am so sorry, and I do feel like a monster. Good, you deserve it. Not for what you posted about some girl in high school. You deserve it for what you did to your friend. The guy who called it Emily is named Herbert. He told Invisibilia that calling her out gave him, gave him a rush of pleasure, like an orgasm. He was asked if he cared about the pain Emily endured. No, I don't care, he replied. I don't care because it's obviously something you deserve, and it's something that's been coming. I literally do not care about what happens to you after the situation. I don't care if she's dead, alive, whatever. I actually don't disagree with the general sentiment of what he's saying. Obviously, I don't think you want to, you know, hold people down and, like, basically hold their head under the water when they're in, in, in pain. But she deserved it. Not because she, she was mean to someone in high school. She deserved it because she's a bad person. She deserved it because she created this. And now she gets to taste her own medicine. It sucks, it does. When the interviewer, Hannah Rosen, showed skepticism, he revealed that he too was a victim. His father beat him throughout his childhood. In this small story, we see something of the maladies that shape our brutal cultural moment. You see how zealotry is often fueled by people working out their psychological wounds. You see that when, when denunciation is done through social media, you can destroy people without even knowing them. There's no personal connection that allows apology and forgiveness. Yes. You also see how once you adopt a binary tribal mentality, us, them, punk, non-punk, victim, victim, abuser, you immediately depersonalized everything. You've reduced complex human beings to simple good versus evil. You've eliminated any sense of proportion. Suddenly, there's no distinction between R. Kelly and a high school girl sending a mean emoji. The podcast gives a glimpse of how cycles of abuse get passed down, one to another. It shows that it's what it's like to live amid a terrifying call-out culture, a vengeful game of moral one-upsmanship in which social annihilation can come any second. But I'd like to point out one very important thing. 
This is unique to the authoritarian, regressive, white supremacist left. Not to the centrists, not to the center leftists, not to the conservatives, not even to, to a certain degree, the far right, the ultra nationalists. You can be a part of any one of these tribes and people will forgive you and they'll have your back unless you're a regressive leftist because then no matter what you do, you're wrong and there's nothing you can do to fix it. When you welcome these people into your community, the authoritarian bullies who want to destroy everything for personal gain, there's only one direction it could go. You will reap what you've sown. So for me, I can say basically however I feel about most things and that's fine. I don't care if some fringe group of wackaloons like Antifa wants to make, you know, put, post BS about me. I laugh. It's like, yeah, sure, whatever. I don't care because I'm not a part of your silly tribe. I posted on Twitter how there was this, uh, this it was like an anarchist forum. Somebody claimed that I showed up to their house at 2 a.m. in Boston, walked into their living room and turned the TV on very loudly, waking everybody up. And they're like, I can't believe he would do that. It was so rude. And everyone just believed it. I have no idea who this person was. I've, I've only been to Boston like three or four times. That's the most insane story I've ever heard. Why would anyone believe that I randomly showed up to a random person's house at 2 a.m. who I don't know and turned their TV on? That's the most insane story ever, but they want to believe it. Now imagine if you're a part of this community. Imagine if you're friends with these people and they make these claims about you. Well, now you're going to get chewed out and what can you say? It's not true. It's a lie. They're going to say you're lying. Accept responsibility for what you've done. And that's it. Bend the knee. Bend the knee to those who want to beat you down for no reason other than it makes them feel good. It gives them a rush, like this man described. These people are ill. But you know what? For the rest of us outside of this group, it is what it is. So, but I, I, I'll end by saying, so long as these corporations actually listen to these fringe wackaloons, yeah, there's going to be problems. But you know what? Whatever, man. I moved far away from New York City, relatively far away. I moved out into the south, you know, the suburbs in South Jersey to just get away from everything. And it's worked so far, but side note, weird thing, weirdest thing ever, Rupert Grint was at my Walmart. I'm like, come on, you know, I, I literally am trying to get away from all of this and find smaller town America. Admittedly, I'm still in the burbs. I'm not like in the middle of nowhere because I need internet. And then Rupert Grint's walking around with his girlfriend and I'm like, of all the places, I'm trying to be in the middle of nowhere, you know? It works for the most part. I don't know. That was a pointless little side note. I just thought it was cool. I wanted to brag about it. Anyway, this is the culture you make. When you, when you create these systems, when you engage in this behavior, it comes back for you so long as you're a part of this group. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll say one last thing. This is why it is so damn hard to interview the left. Because people will come after them no matter what. Everything you do is wrong when you're part of the regressive left. It's just a matter of time until someone decides to point the finger at you. Which means if you do an interview with someone like, you know, Sargon... You could say something that's innocuous and someone could be like, oh, but I can get you on that. And they'll wait and they'll hold it and they'll lord it over you. Screw that. I don't want nothing to do with it. Anyway, thanks for hanging out. Stick around. Go to uh, at 4 p.m. YouTube.com slash Timcast and I will see you all then.